You're listening to The Other 50%, a history of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. Our presenting sponsor is the entertainment payroll company, Extreme Reach. What you may not know about Extreme Reach is that they are already an industry disruptor in the areas of creative asset management and video ad distribution, and now they're poised to disrupt the entertainment payroll business. If you're creating content, call them and tell them I sent you. Today, I got to speak with Pamela Douglas. Pamela is an award-winning writer with numerous credits in television drama. She consults internationally with professional TV writers and producers and has lectured in Africa, Europe, and throughout the U.S. She was awarded the Humanitas Prize for Between Mother and Daughter on CBS and has garnered multiple Emmy nominations and American Women in Radio and Television Awards for her other dramas. Her book, Writing the TV Drama Series, just came out in its fourth edition, and we talked about what is in the book and how to make it as a TV writer. She is also an incredible visual artist. Her house is filled with her art, and I became quite emotional looking at a couple of pieces, which really never happens to me with art. I thought it was stunning. I will link to her website and her book on my website so that you can see and learn more. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. Also, the insider's guide to breaking into and navigating Hollywood called Catch a Break has launched and it is available on Apple Podcasts, all the podcast places, and on the website catchabreakpodcast.com. Go check that one out too. All right, here's my conversation with Pamela Douglas. Have a listen. What do you do? I create and I mainly create for what I hope is the elucidation of uh, possibilities. I'm very interested in not only work that people do now in any of the arts, but and of course especially screenwriting, but also with the evolving forms that I find so exciting and so empowering. The old days of what people could write, where people could get that work out to the public, and the kinds of mixed mediums that people are now involved in. All those old 20th century forms have become a whole big opening to what people can do, not just in the future, but even right now. It's amazing. Now, I know that you are an artist and a screenwriter and a book writer and a professor. And what we're going to talk about a lot today is your book called Writing the TV Drama Series. Yeah. Boy, is that a good tool. Well, it was created originally simply to be a tool, but over the last decade it has evolved. I started this book in 2005, which is, in television, is uh, ancient history. (laughs) Uh, In 2005, there was no streaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, HBO was still young and new, had, did have some shows, so there was such a thing as premium cable, but not much. And most people were still watching traditional, you know, the legacy networks. It was must-see TV still. Well, yeah, you were still watching ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean you, but, you know, the public. I was. Because, well, everybody was, because that's what you could get. Mm -hmm. And there was still the idea that television was a box in the living room Mm -hmm. where you had to watch things when they were programmed. Yes, there was already some innovation. There were the possibility for some people of pre-recording and seeing something later. But it was rare and it was expensive. And again, streaming wasn't even an idea. When that book came out, the one in 2005... There was a way of writing television that was well established. It was everything was a teaser and four acts because there were commercial breaks Mm -hmm. at the end of every act. So that had to be a specific amount of time and that everything, an hour drama, lasted an hour. And actually it was less than an hour because you had commercials at roughly every 15 minutes. Premium cable, starting with HBO, of course, did away with the commercials and the act breaks, but there was still the sense of things had a form. The minute that book came out, and I think it was 2006, ABC had gone to six acts, 
and there started to be a rumbling that the old structures were changing. So the very first seminar that I gave after the 2005 book, the first edition came out, somebody raised their hand and said, I'm proposing something for a show. It's not in four acts. It's in five acts. What should I do? (laughs) And I thought, oh my goodness, Uh, this book is out one day (laughs) and, and and it's out of date. So I scrambled and wrote a second edition that was out in 2007 that caught up a little bit. I talked more about basic cable. By now we had basic cable as well as premium cable because by now AMC had started to exist with Mad Men and uh, it was still before the era of Breaking Bad. But it was starting to open up and the idea of the rigid structures was crumbling, but it was still the same. Well, that lasted a few years, and now things were really starting to happen because I was blindsided. As much as I try to keep up, I was completely blindsided by Netflix. Who wasn't? Uh, They were a place where you bought DVDs. They arrived in little red envelopes, and that's all it was, old movies that you would buy. But also, I, was, I wasn't ready for Breaking Bad, and I wasn't ready for some of the global appreciation of, uh, of what was going on. Uh, I, gave, uh, I gave international seminars sometimes, and I, I was stunned to find that in Africa, people knew who Don Draper was from, uh, <laughs> yeah, from Mad Men. I think, why in the world would anybody here be interested in a white guy from the 1950s on Madison Avenue who sold ads. Mm -hmm. Of course, the answer is that people aren't interested in the categories, they're interested in characterization. But the weird thing was that AMC at that time did not have a a delivery system to Africa. But everybody knew this. How were they getting it? How were they getting it? They were pulling it off the satellite. Everybody around the world, as I went to other places, was looking at American television. Now that's going to change, but was looking at American television for free (laughs) because they were pulling it off the satellite. Well, we can't have that. No, well, in places, you could have it, of course, but but in places where there was no delivery system. Mm -hmm. So I started to say, wait a minute, a lot more is happening. So in 2015, I thought this is really hopeless because now everything is different and yet I've got this third edition. I'm starting to be embarrassed at uh, teaching my students to use the third edition because even though I'm now allowing allowing for forms that don't have act breaks or that don't have the four act structure or the five or the six act structure, and I'm beginning to talk about how The Walking Dead was a global phenomenon, for example, uh, from its first arrival, and other shows. But it's still all wrong, because here comes Netflix, and all of a sudden, House of Cards, and then followed by uh, Orange is the New Black, which completely blew open. Changed everything. Changed everything. Orange is the New Black, because of the cast also, Now, that's not the only multi-ethnic cast by then, but it was the only multi-ethnic cast where the characters were shown in such dimension and were stars. So prisoners. And prisoners. It it changed everything. Changed everything. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, I need to write another book. I wasn't ready for a fourth edition, so I wrote an intermediate book called The Future of Television. It came out in 2015, which I realized in retrospect was enormous hubris. How could I possibly (laughs) say something was the future of television? And so, of course, by the time it came out in 2015, it was the present of television. And one year later, it was the past of television. How do you (laughs) even keep up teaching this? Like, how are you teaching form to your writing students when it changes all the time? I teach the change. I teach opportunity. I teach uh, don't be stuck. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also am very careful to teach all of our magnificent history because just because something is 10 years old or 20 years old doesn't mean it wasn't great. I still show MASH, Mm -hmm. 1980s. I still show parts of NYPD Blue, 1990s. Uh, And then Sopranos came out, you know, we're now celebrating the 20th anniversary in 1999, really it's considered 2000 Mm -hmm. mainly, but I I show those because we don't lose the past, we just build on it. 
So I still refer to the great television that has existed. People sometimes forget that The Wire is still groundbreaking now. Yeah has been off the air for a decade. And people need to know, especially if they're in a room pitching, the people mm -hmm. you're pitching to are going to remember those shows and you have to get the references and know what they're talking about. You should. Some people think, some very young students think that the world started today. <laughs> and, you know... And, Didn't we all? And they're only interested in something on YouTube and I think that's to their great disadvantage as yeah. creative people. Anyway, I did this book, which was immediately out of date, and then I said, okay, you know what? I really have to tackle the big changes in television holistically. And that's when I did the uh, fourth edition, just out in, uh, at the very end of 2018. Of course I understand that time will pass it. Of course mm -hmm. I understand that. But one of the big things I wanted to put in this edition, in ad on top of all the things that are happening in streaming, all the new forms, all the new ways things get on television, uh, is the global perspective. So almost a third of this book is international. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that's, that is a present reality of our world, that even as countries are fractured in some ways politically, the truth is that television is, in a sense, the great uniter because we are seeing media all of, from all over the world, and they are seeing us. Mm -hmm. That is really what is going to build empathy and communication and cooperation around the world, I think. It's so powerful. Well, you hope so. Uh, 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 one of the things that stunned me in the uh, research on North Korea, of all places, where I had a research assistant, uh, did a wonderful job on the international research, and I said, uh, okay, now we're going to look into Korea. So I thought she was just going to hand me, you know, research on South Korea. And she, had, and she gave me North Korea as well. And I said, why are you bothering? If you look at a map, you'll see there's no lights on. Yeah, what are they watching? What can they possibly be watching? Because there's a little bit of government propaganda, but there's really no television. And I found out that wasn't true. I found out that the bootlegging of South Korean television in North Korea at the penalty of death is uh, alive and well. Wow. Uh, and so I was, I was stunned to see that, but also to realize if people in places like North Korea are told there is told lies about what's outside, but they can see South Korea, or, so, or some of them can see, or many of them can see, that it's not true, what is that going to do to the thinking of the population and the malleability of the population? Mm -hmm. Now, you see the weaponizing of television everywhere. Uh, Turkey, as one a good example, which has weaponized uh, dramatic television by having gorgeous, gorgeous, heroic tales of when the Ottoman Empire was in charge of everything, <laughs> <laughs> supporting the current government. So they are clearly using it for propaganda. But then, you know, before criticizing Turkey for doing that, you have to think, well, isn't everybody? <laughs> it is very powerful medium, and we really have to use it carefully. And yeah. it's, it's not a stretch to say there is some of that in the United States. Well, no kidding. No kidding. I mean, there is definitely a vision of what uh, executives, some executives, would like to present as the United States. The funny thing is that there is such a diversity on television right now that there's no way to put a lid on it. Yeah, there's no controlling it. There's really no controlling it, even if somebody wanted to try. I mean, Fox News can do what it wants, but the truth is you can also tune into something else. And uh, that's not true in all countries. Yeah, there's still a hundred other news outlets. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's drill down on this a little bit. And sure. then I also want to talk about your career as a writer. Yeah. yeah. So in this book, you go through a lot of the, what feels like the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. Like, what is, the, what is the form and the format and the structure, which as you say, is changing all the time. And I loved, and I'm skipping into the middle, I loved a graphic you did where the, the acts were different patterns of little boxes, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. you sprinkle them together mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. make the episode. Yeah. I loved that. You talk about three qualities of episodic TV. Can you talk about what those are? Yeah. Episodic television is a special way of thinking about storytelling because unlike movies that end in two hours or however long they are, and have an arc that completes. Episodes, episodic television that is not anthological, that is, has a continuing story, offers a long narrative. And you have the opportunity of going uh, in depth with the characters. 
So the episodic characterization is the, is the first big change. Whereas, as I said, you have an arc that begins with a character wanting something, some opposition, and solving it in a feature film, and the person completes his or her journey. That's the opposite of what you do in television, because instead of going wide as a narrative line, as a plot, you need to go in depth. And episodic characterization in the best dramas and comedies uh, has to do with revealing layers. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with going deep rather than wide. And so that's why I talk about the long narratives. Uh, even in limited series, meaning that the whole series is only six hours or eight hours, and that's a popular form, uh, you still have a story, think about it, a storyline that goes for eight hours. No movie goes for that long. Right. Or in a long-running series, it could be 100 hours. It's years and they hours. become your friends. Well, <laughs> and then you're so sad when they're no longer on no the air. No kidding. That's... The, it is like real live people because you learn them as you learn a friend, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and it means that even if your friend does has an impact from the outside world, say there's a health thing or a car crash or you know any or marriage at difficulty, whatever it is that the person has, uh, they don't change as people. The event makes them realize certain things, may cause them to express certain feelings that they had repressed or to discover some things about themselves. But they are still your friend. They mm -hmm. are still that person. And that's the way you look at characterization in writing episodes or epi long form episodic drama. I also have another piece here in the book where I talk about collaboration. And a television staff, as opposed to somebody sitting home writing their script, mm -hmm. Uh, is essentially a collaborative effort, but it doesn't suppress any individual creativity. I think of it as additive, because you sit in a room, hopefully with other people who are also bright, caring, have something to say, and are skilled. So nobody is having to pull along, you know, some duds. Actually, what happens is that you say, let's do a story about this, and somebody says, in the best scenario, yes, and this can be whatever, which is different from yes, but, mm -hmm. or no. <laughs> so if you're in a room with the yes, ands, then you have a, a building situation. And there are many staffs that are like that. Not all of them, unfortunately, but there are many. And you also have collaboration across crafts. Um, television is writer driven. Mm -hmm. So the writer is the first dreamer and is really in charge. Uh, the way to get to be a showrunner is through being a writer. But you also will be working with actors, you're also working with directors, you're also working with uh, set designers, with location experts, the whole realm. And everybody brings their own talent and their own insight, and you're always discovering. And I would imagine once an actor has played a role for eight or ten years, oh my goodness, I they, bet they have a lot to say. Uh, I love talking to actors because they do, the best ones do, deep preparation in terms of character background, which is beyond what's on the page. Mm -hmm. And you really hope they bring something to your lines that not only understands what you wrote, but actually enhances it. And what you really hope is that a, you're getting the kind of wonderful co collaboration I've had sometimes with directors. I had a great experience one, at one point. It was actually a, not an episodic, it was a movie for television. And uh, he came over and went through my script with me, literally sentence by sentence, and said, what are you thinking of here? What would you like here? Mm. I've also had directors who say, I'm going to have to move the camera between this line and that line. Can you give me an extra line? And I, I so appreciate that they asked me to do it rather than trying to intervene in the script. Yeah. And that kind of respect is not unusual in television for the writer. So I was, I was delighted with that. That's wonderful. And what a gift as a director to have the writer there and what was in your head to well, inform what they're doing. Uh, uh, this was a wonderful director. I've had several wonderful directors who have done this. And that's one of the differences between television and movies, that on television, the writer really has power, mm -hmm. is respected, and is in charge. There are some movies where you have a director who really regards a script as nothing but raw material for them to go and do their autoristic creative, you know, vision. And 
if it's the writer who is also the director, maybe that makes sense because it's all one piece. When you're subverting what the writer wrote because of your ego, that's not so good. Well, the writer may be nowhere near the set and the director can rewrite the whole thing. Well, you hope not. Uh, the writer may want to be near and may be forbidden. Right. There are sometimes, but this doesn't happen in television. It really doesn't happen in television. Television is is all good news for writers. Now let's talk about your experience being in the writer's room on some yeah. shows. What was that like? Writer's rooms are, to me, tremendous sources of energy. I have been very fortunate that some of the showrunners that I was pleased to work with, especially as a beginner, uh, were generous enough to be willing to teach. Mm -hmm. So for a real beginner who gets on a show, um, it's, it's like postgraduate education. If you're coming in at the lowest possible level, you've never been on a show before, and here you are uh, feeling awed by the more experienced writers there who really know how to navigate this, and you're just waiting for your first assignment on the show. Uh, it is so nice to have some of the more senior people, but especially even the showrunner, uh, be willing to sit down with you and say, well, we're trying to accomplish this and we're going to need a break here. Or we're trying to emphasize that character now and this part of it. You know, just, just to talk you through it. When I was a total, total beginner, uh, there weren't any classes that now exist like mm. I teach. Uh, and I had to be taught by the showrunners and the people on staff because I, at that time, there were act breaks and I didn't know where they were or how you got to an act break or what an act break meant in terms of structuring your story. So and it really was an apprentice space. It was like being an apprentice mm -hmm. uh, in a way. I don't think people have so much time for that anymore. But that was an early experience of staff. Beyond that, they can be... It, it, every staff is different. Every staff is different. Uh, and there's good, bad, and middle. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, there's energy. Uh, energy of, even if it's competitive energy, as opposed to the best supportive energy. And there's both sometimes. That you hear people just throwing out ideas or even lines or possibilities. Some work, some don't work, but in the best collaborative writer's room, it's really everybody working together. Then each writer who is assigned to an episode goes off and does that alone, and it is your personal project. But then you bring it back to the writer's room, and it's a little bit like a, the best kind of workshop mm -hmm. uh, in the best scenario, where somebody says, you know, I love this scene, it would be even better if you cut it here, or uh, or it may be, I love this scene, but you know we have something similar in the episode before or after, so we're going to have to, you know, escalate the story, the narrative a little bit faster, which means instead of this happening, that happens. So then you go home and you do another draft of that. Once in a while, uh, you miss a voice, especially if you're new on a show, mm -hmm. and you, the stuff is good, but somebody wouldn't say a character wouldn't say things exactly as you wrote it. In an unfortunate situation, another writer on the staff takes your script and might re-dialogue somebody, and that's, that doesn't feel good. But it's in service of something that, if you're on a series, uh, you have to be in service of, which is the, the show and not just your personal work. Right, just making it better. It just makes the whole thing better, and you learn from that. So uh, I, I think staffs are really exciting. But like anything else run by humans, the problem is that they're run by humans. And <laughs> humans do what humans do. Yeah. Uh, I know you wrote in the book, you learn the hard way uh, a couple of times things not to do when you're in a writer's room. Can you tell us a couple of those well, stories? Well, I made mistakes, as everybody does when they start out. And the first mistake I made was feeling that you could, once you had your assignment, you just go home and write, <laughs> and you don't have to be there. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake, because while I was home writing my script, lots of things had changed. An actor left the show, other things happened, but also the rest of the staff was bonding, and I was out of it. So I came back into a world that was different where my script didn't fit anymore. And uh, wow, that was a heavy learning experience. Hadn't one of your characters been killed off while you yeah, were off they, writing the yeah, next Yeah, one scene? of the actors left the show, yeah. So it, and also episodes that were before and after would impact it, and I didn't know. I was out of the loop, and that was a big mistake I would, if I would never make again. You really have to be there, even if it means you're sitting around all day looking at dailies, talking to other writers, and ending up doing a lot of your writing at home at night. 
Uh, so that's that was one lesson I learned by making a mistake. Uh, now, are you often the only woman in a room? In the early days, I was the only woman anywhere. I was the only uh, woman full-time professor at USC teaching writing for many years. I was the only woman in a writer's room. I was the only, I was the only everything. I was the only woman executive when I first started being executive way back at Universal Studios. I was always the only everything. It isn't true anymore. Although it is so that there are fewer women showrunners than male showrunners, but that's improving. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some big stars now, Genji Cohen, Jill Soloway. Shonda. Uh, of course, Shonda Rhimes. Alex, there's a good <coughs> list of gifted, brilliant uh, women. Oh, and I've, I've, I'm thinking drama. I've left out the comedies. Uh, you know, there's... Um, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler. Tina Fey, yeah, and um, Insecure. Issa Rae. Issa Rae. And I'm sure we're leaving out somebody wonderful. Of course, we can't name them all. Um, so there, there are potent, successful, courageous women running shows now. So some shows have all women stat. And there are some shows, if you're looking at uh, Jill Soloway's shop uh, for Transparent, where they went a step beyond having mostly women, which is they uh, really want fluid gender. Yeah, there's a lot of non-binary on that show. Non-binary, that's the nature of the show. It's also the nature of the, of the showrunner. And um, so this whole world of uh, dominated by white men who forced their predilections on everybody else is, is gone. It's really gone. It, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist somewhere for somebody, but... Um, but those days are over. Those days are really 20th century. Yeah, we're They're not having really that over. anymore. They're, it's really gone. And uh, it could almost be argued, as one of my students said, sadly, uh, the student is a white man, and he said, is there any hope for me? <laughs> and I, uh, of course, it's a silly question because, sure, there are plenty of white men on shows. Yeah, you're going to be fine. But, uh, but I understood why he asked it. Sure, and I, I think the answer is y yes, and now you really have to be really good. Well, yeah. It's not going to be enough to be one of the guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. So in all those situations where you were the only woman doing whatever you were doing, how did that shape your style, how you thought about leadership, how you thought about fitting in? W was that a real conscious <laughs> thing for you, how to navigate that? I tell a story in the book, which would not exist today, but it was emblematic of uh, the bad times where I was on a show where I was the only woman in the room, and the guys spent every meeting uh, talking about the latest sports event. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody brought uh, a ball, well, baseball or something, to the room. And they spent the room you know, tossing around this ball and talking about who scored something or who hit something. You know, deep into the sports page, of men, as I say in the book, doing things with balls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no way to do anything except sit there for the first 10, 15 minutes of every meeting because every meeting started with guy sports uh, until at one point I, I said, gee, you know, my success on this show has nothing to do with what I write. It has to do with what I know about sports. So I actually got the sports page of the newspaper and attempted to read it. <laughs> thing is, you know... I didn't know what I was reading in the first place. I, I couldn't yeah. do it. And that on that same show, there was uh, an experience where we were breaking an outline. We were talking about a storyline that was evolving. That was all going fine. And time came to take a break. And all the men got up and went to the men's room where they continued talking about breaking the episode. And I stood outside. That wouldn't happen today, though. It would not happen today. Yeah, and Nelsko Vell tells a very similar story that she had an experience like that where all the guys figured it out over the weekend at the guy's house that she was invited to. Well, that was another thing that happened on that same show that they got, I realized that they were getting together on the weekend to shoot hoops. Mm -hmm. And so they had a strong bond that I, it didn't matter what, how good a writer I was or anything I said, I was just wrong. But again, that wouldn't happen now. It really wouldn't happen now. And I think that's important for the young listeners or any writer trying to break in to know that this bad ancient history is ancient history. That if you get on a show now, uh, although there is still a certain culture that may exist on some shows, the idea that you have something to say will not be ignored again in the same way. 
you do have a hierarchy on shows because mm -hmm. the people who are running the shows, even given the great women showrunners we now have, uh, tend to be people with a lot of experience. The people who have a lot of experience are people who have been doing it for a long time and may have come up in that era where it was all dominated by the men. Uh, and so they are still in charge and they themselves are, are struggling to adjust to the new reality. Mm -hmm. So you find a tier system on many shows where the very top level, the showrunner and the supervising producer perhaps, and maybe some of the other producers are older older men, older white men actually. And then you come under that to the lowest level of the beginners and they're trying to bring in a diverse group. Mm -hmm. So you've got the baby writers who are women and uh, people of color or people who are diverse in some other way. Mm -hmm. And the top echelon is still the same old guys until the time comes when the baby writers get promoted. It's not <laughs> automatic that that would happen because there's a, a, a sophomore year problem that happens to a lot of these baby writers, especially if they're coming from the fellowships, because the fellowships pay the one-year salary for the baby writers. After that first year, they have to be paid by the show, and so the show sometimes drop them. Oh, so it's harder to get that second it's year. It's harder to get the second year than the first year, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, because it does. Oh, interesting. You have to have proven yourself, though. Okay, so what do you say to someone fresh out of school who has their script who thinks they're going to jump right in and be a showrunner? Well, that's silly. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a showrunner if your show's on YouTube. Yeah, that is true. You can always do a web series, uh, raise your own outside funds, cast it yourself, and hope somebody watches. But NBC is probably not going to hire you. The chances of going from a YouTube three-minute video to being on the staff of anything is very slight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's a good experience, but it's not the road. The road is very clear right now, and it's, it's a bit problematic because it also favors people coming out of film schools. Mm -hmm. There are many good film schools now, and you can do that. But what I would say to anybody is your path is first go to a film school that teaches television. You really should get an education. This is not back in the days where you look at something on television and say, oh, I can write that, and then you write that. Right. Everybody in the business has had an education now. So go to some film school. Then after you've learned your craft and you have your skills and you have uh, your, your spec script, two pilot scripts and a feature film, not to mention anything else you may also have. So that's your portfolio once you have that. Then you apply to the fellowships. Every network and many other organizations have fellowships for people coming out of film school. That's, there's the uh, ABC Disney one, there's CBS, which is diversity, NBC has uh, Writers on the Verge, HBO now has one, Fox has long had one. Warner Brothers uh, has one. Warner Brothers Fellowship Everybody is great. Has one. Sundance has one now. They're all over the place. Humanitas has a great prize too. So there's plenty of them to apply for. Some of them have restrictions on who they give the awards to. But in general, they're great opportunities. Once you get into that program, it's a six month program where they pay you and they set you up with a mentor, with a mentor program actually. And you will write an episode for one of their shows as a sample, just as a learning experience. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you do that very well, they then set you up on a show. They put you, they actually place you as a baby writer. In the room. In the show, you've got a job. You've got a job with a salary Great. for uh, one season. If you do well, you're, you got your gold. Uh, Angela Kang, who is now risen to be showrunner on The Walking Dead, uh, started this way by being placed there by I forget which fellowship one of her I think it was she was at CBS which is interesting because Walking Dead is not a CBS show but the CBS fellowship placed her on an AMC show oh. so you can be placed somewhere else and then uh, then you go and go and go if you don't do well in the fellowship they won't place you and then you can try to get another fellowship or you could go a different route altogether if you can't do any of that, if you don't win a fellowship, if you don't have a strong portfolio, uh, if you're not able to get an agent or a manager, which is another way to get in the loop, then what I recommend to somebody coming out of school or just coming out of anything is just get a job on a show. Mm -hmm. Any job, receptionist, secretary, 
PA, assistant to somebody, any job at all, because now you're in the loop, at least on the production part of the loop. Now people know you, and since they know you, they're embarrassed not to read your script. <laughs> uh, if they like what you read, uh, what you wrote, then you then know you have a chance. You have a chance. Maybe they'll give you a shot in, at an audition script. Mm -hmm. And if they like that, maybe you'll get a job, or you'll get a job that leads to a job that leads to a job. So uh, get in the mix. You really have to get in the mix. The other problem is you kind of need to be in Los Angeles. There are other hubs around the world where there's some production, but New York, for example, mm -hmm. Miami is another. Atlanta. Atlanta, specific shows in Atlanta. But uh, the fact is there's going to be uh, work here in L.A. Right now as we speak, there's more than 500 shows in production today in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area. Okay, come on down. Well, it's not the easiest thing. People sometimes come here with a dream. You know, I'm going to hit Hollywood Boulevard and mm -hmm. then I'll be a star. Uh, and it doesn't work. You shouldn't come until you're ready. Yeah, and then you have to network like crazy. The and door. then you join everything you can join. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are plenty of organizations here. Uh, go to speeches at the, the workshops or presentations at the Writers Guild. There's a panel every night of the week you can go to. There's so much that it's overwhelming. I, I don't get to most anything. <laughs> um, and there are other schools here, too, and programs that are not the major universities. Of course, the major universities are the best, but, but there are smaller workshops and places where you just meet and greet and mm -hmm. start to know what's happening. Sure. Now, what is your recommendation for getting representation? Ideally, you want to have a, an agent because an agent knows where the openings are and can put you in the room. Some of the best students at some of the best schools do get representation uh, from programs that the schools have. Like USC, where I teach, they have uh, an event called First Pitch, which if you're an MFA major graduating with an MFA, they set you up with, uh, in effect, a cycle of meetings where you can be interviewed. Wow. Uh, some other schools may have some, some version of that. It's easier because they're here and the agents send representation to the event and people do get represented that way. Lots of them do. Yeah, I think that's worth the price of tuition. <laughs> Just well, that. If, you can, if you can get a career in television, as expensive as tuition is, uh, you pay it all back. For sure. You'll be able to pay off your loans. You can. Not everybody gets a career. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a struggle. And one thing you can do if you're just out in the cold trying, it doesn't hurt to just call the agents, agencies. Uh, do your research first. See who they represent that's, that's a little bit like the kind of work you do. And see if you can get an actual name of a real agent rather than the agency. Uh, you won't get that agent on the phone. But you can get the agent's assistant or secretary on the phone and ask whether the agent is willing to receive a letter from you and perhaps read a script. The chances in 90% of the cases will be no. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is, if you say something that's especially interesting about you, where you're from, what you've written, awards you've won, anything good like that, um, maybe they'll be willing to read it or an assistant will be uh, willing to read it and recommend you. It's a long shot, but you could try it. And then you write a one page uh, email, less than one page, really, really short, just about the great stuff about you, asking if you may send them a script. This is, this is difficult, but not impossible. Less than agents uh, are managers mm -hmm. who are not licensed by the state of California, so you have to watch and make sure somebody's a genuine manager. Oh, so a friend of mine had uh, a manager, I say with air quotes, reach out to them and say, I'd be happy to mentor you for $800 a month. Okay, that's, <laughs> you see, that's a, that's a scam. For sure that's a scam. Don't yeah. do that. No. There are, however, consultants that do charge but are genuine. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you that they're going to place your work. They don't tell you they're the managers. They're consultancies, uh, and you can look them up. I have, I have several of them mentioned in my book, So, uh, along with their emails. Uh, you do pay them, and they do consult, but they are, it's more like going to a school. Mm -hmm. you know, they will teach you how to make your script better, which is not the same thing as getting you into uh, an interview. Right. But if but there are real managers out there. Agents cannot charge more than ten percent. Managers can charge more, fifteen percent typically, or more. Uh, a manager 
generally manages all of your career, not just uh, agenting a property. But these days, there are many managers that are functioning almost identically as agents and are a little bit easier to get to. Just make sure that they're, they're legitimate. Mm -hmm. And one way to do that is to find out who else they represent right. or who they have placed uh, clients on, or what shows they have placed clients on. If you can't get an agent or a manager, and for some reason you don't want to go through these consulting services, which can actually help you get hooked up a little bit, the better ones. Mm -hmm. Another thing, there are a couple of other end runs you can try. Some entertainment attorneys who you will have to pay function kind of as quasi-managers in the sense that uh, if they like your work, they themselves can talk to, can recommend it to the next stage up, a friend or a colleague who is an agent. It's a little pricey, and you have to know that this is somebody who you need at this stage because it's an attorney. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't need an attorney right now, and maybe the attorney doesn't have time for you. It's a little bit of a long shot. There is another loop around altogether, which has to do with social media and with networking. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to be represented at all. You just have to make a big presence. And this is where we come back around to YouTube and all, and uh, even Facebook is now doing original programming, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And see if you can get a following. If you can get a, a good following, that's not as easier, easier said than done. But if you can get a real following to something online, uh, you can get attention mm -hmm. from somebody who is looking for especially young voices. And this is particularly true in comedy. You can also get noticed as a playwright, and you can get noticed as a stand-up comedian if you're interested in comedy. You could also see if you can write for an actor who you know has a deal. Most actors uh, who are established have production companies of their own. Mm -hmm. And actually see if you could get go right around the whole agency loop and see if you can get interest from an actor's production company if there is a role that would very much interest them. If so, they will take over your project and be the producer of your project or hook you up with somebody more experienced. The risk in some of this is, if you're a beginner with no credits, is that you will just be bought out right? Uh, and that you're, not, you're off the project altogether. Which is heartbreaking, but you still sold a script. It can help if you have some credit. I have uh, some life experiences that I mention in the book mm -hmm. of people who, who thought they had made it big only to find out <laughs> that, that it was just a buyout and they didn't want to hear from them after that. Right. Why aren't they calling me for the rewrite? Yeah. No, that's delicious. A big portion of this book is personal stories, which is so compelling and Absolutely. So, so interesting. Yeah. Talking today, 2019, what is the act structure right now? <laughs> For television. There isn't one. There are plenty of shows on networks, on basic cable, and in some odd ways, even on premium cable, though it's suppressed, uh, that use the traditional structure because it works. Mm -hmm. Four acts and a teaser is a real good uh, rhythm for an hour. And I think it's good to learn on also because it gives you the sense of what an hour feels like and of where you want to peak and let go and it it just helps shape your your narrative. So it's important to know the foundation before you start improvising. I think it's, I teach it to my students. At USC, all of the professors start them on four acts and a teaser, mm -hmm. and then tell them, drop those out if you are going to Netflix or HBO, because it won't look good there. But learn it. Right. Learn it so you'd learn the rhythm. But I would say the same thing that five acts also works, five acts and a teaser. Beyond that, I wouldn't do it. Uh, however, in the book, I do demonstrate a Netflix approach, which is not an act structure at all. It's a character-driven approach where you make, uh, say you have three major storylines or three major characters, and you plan the arc for each one, and then you weave those arcs, and that works too. The funny thing is that even in making an arc for one of those major characters, which is not part of the act structure, you still have to organize that into a dramatic form, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't look like act. So you're still, in a way, back to how you start, what happens in the middle, uh, where you make your twists and turns, and how you resolve. So in a way, you're back to basic dramatic structuring anyway. 
Well, I love how you're so visual and how you explain it. And I, you had so many graphs and mm -hmm. kind of pictures in here as to how it's all yeah. formed, which I love because I'm a very visual person. It all just makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. uh, which also I think leads to you're an artist as well. Could we do want to talk about that for a minute? Sure, sure. I'm delighted to talk about that. So I'm looking around your house and the art on the walls is incredible. And then you told me it was all yours and I'm... I'm blown away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think many artists do more than one art form. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are musicians who write or, or paint, and there are uh, actors who also paint, and there are writers who also do music. I mean, it's... Uh, Johnny Depp is a musician. Yes. <laughs> it's not unusual to find that people are in more than one art form. For me, it's, it's deeply rooted. Um, I have always had two prongs. Uh, I started writing as a child, but I've also uh, recently uh, cleaned up my art studio and found some work that came from my teen years. Mm. And I thought, oh, this is going to be awful. And I realized that it isn't awful. Wonderful. Uh, some of it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> but some of it isn't. And, and I've started exhibiting some earlier work along with current work and finding out to my amazement how well it fits. Um, I was just uh, featured in a booth in the uh, L.A. art show at the convention center, which was a huge, huge art show and a great honor to be in it. And fortunately, I had some major sales there, not that I focus on sales particularly. But, but still, that's nice. It's very, very nice. And I'm working on a series right now, which is on uh, immigration, refugees especially. I've been so moved by that. And mm -hmm. I'm doing a 60-foot uh, a installation that'll be in a solo show this fall, where uh, it's all figures larger than life-size figures and their migration around the room. It's, it's I'm, I'm just thrilled with that. It's a lot of work. It's, it's going to be a two, three-year project. What's the medium? Uh, that particular medium for my next show, on one level, it's charcoal and pastel drawing on a huge canvas, but all of the characters have artifacts with them. And I was fortunate enough to find, this is a departure from what this interview is about, but anyway, I was fortunate enough to find somebody who had a uh, years and years of, cof of burlap coffee bean bags from all around the world uh, that she gave me. Oh, and cool. now these characters have sacks on their back made of these rope and these coffee bean bags, and that's also part of the background. So that's, that's a sense of mixing uh, many mediums, and I also use clay for... Um, some of the three-dimensional parts. But I've worked in all sorts of media. I'm looking around the room. Uh, there's one where uh, it's got leaves and a bird's nest. It's an actual bird's nest she's holding in her hand. Coming right out of the painting. It's amazing. It's, it's on the painting itself. And um, one of the, the ones that I exhibited at the LA Art Show was made of tree parts. How cool. There's a woman, a woman I call uh, idol with her clay hands out and a beautiful face, but on her head is this enormous crown, which is actually the top part of the seeds of a palm tree. Mm. Uh, so I, I like to look in the world and just find marvelous things, and then they become part of what I have to say. And where can people see your art? You have a website for that? I do have a website. I'll tell you what it is right now. Please, go, everybody, go visit it. It's, it's easy. It's pamdouglasart.com. I'm going there right away. And I have a blog on it. So please look at the blog, because the blog, uh, on the website, there are many oh, series that I've done for the last 10 years or so. But on uh, the blog, it's work in progress. It's exactly what I have done that month. And I talk about how I did it and what I was thinking when I did it. So in that sense, I'm, I'm integrating writing and the art because I talk about it in the blog. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, and the book is called Writing the TV Drama Series, and I'll link to that on my website, too. Well, it's the fourth edition. The fourth Every, edition. Everybody, please know <laughs> it's the fourth edition because sometimes people have seen earlier editions and they think that's it. But television moves so fast and is so rich that you really need the fourth edition. Yes, because you need to know how Netflix and binge watching has changed the whole landscape. And how uh, we are all one with the global uh, television marketplace too. Right. So what did I not ask you about that I should have asked you about? What else are you curious about? Well, I always ask people kind of what do you make of women in the last couple of years? 
in this business and in this country? Oh, I think the ascent of women is profound. Um, not only because of the showrunners that I mentioned, but also because the uh, interpretation of women's lives has sun suddenly gotten more awoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's, uh, there are posters at USC in the hall that come from movies from long, long, you know, the mid 20th century and before. And it's stunning how wrong those feel, how those would never happen now. Uh, there's uh, Rudy Valentino, you know, in, uh, with this damsel, yeah. you know, and it's, today it looks rapey yeah. to us. Uh, and plenty of others, mostly there's the damsel in distress, ah, with some guy, you know, with his claws <laughs> out. Uh, and that's what the old movie, po or over-sexualized women. Yeah. Um, Even just the ads that people are recycling now, like, look at how, look at how we used to sell products, which is so oh, ridiculous. Oh, shocking, shocking. Yeah. Um, but it's the fact that it's shocking is, is the news. You know, right. I think Me Progress. Too had a lot to do with it. I think Time's Up had a lot to do with it. But I think it's many things. Um, that despite the sad result, in my opinion, of the last presidential election, we did have a woman candidate. Uh, and we also had a woman candidate who was not a pretty little girl, mm -hmm. who was a deeply experienced, qualified woman. Could not have been more qualified. Exactly. Uh, things worked out badly, in my opinion, but, <laughs> um, but just the fact that it happened meant something. Yeah. And we have women uh, who may be running uh, in 2020 as well. Uh, There's lots already. Lots already and uh, very powerful, bright women who are not in any way uh, kowtowing to uh, the old stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't places and people who are uncomfortable for that, with that. And uh, one of the problems that we see in... Uh, in reaction to some things on television is that people feel very threatened. Mm -hmm. So one trend, there's a counter trend, which I think is small, I hope, on network legacy television of uh, re retreading sh uh, shows from the mid 50s, um, just re rebooting very old shows mm -hmm. that uh, it's not quite Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver yet, uh, but you know, looking in that direction. And I think it's because there are people who are frightened, just frightened by the magnitude and speed of change. Mm -hmm. But as many as there are who really want to go back to 20th century or mid 20th century television and ideas, the younger generation, I think, is very much ready for what's new. And I am looking forward to uh, not just the new new events in global and international television, and but also new forms. I don't know what's going to happen with three-dimensional TV hmm. um, or how soon we're going to see holographic TV or uh, and how that's going to change writing. But I think it will change it, and I also think it's inevitable uh, how much augmented reality and virtual reality will change uh, narrative scripts. But these things are going to change. <coughs> Excuse me. These things are going to change uh, our perception of storytelling to a degree, and we're going to see it first on television, I think, mm -hmm. given the definition of television that the Writers Guild offers, which is television is everything that is not in a closed theater. <laughs> <laughs> that was smart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've kept you well over an hour. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. I'm delighted to do this. You've been listening to The Other 50%, a history of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Pamela Douglas for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. And go subscribe to catchabreakpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.